Please be sure to like and subscribe to all of our social media channels. I'm going to go ahead and get this party started because I am so excited about the discussion today. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today at Secular AZ, our Friday noon speaker series. Uh, again, if you haven't, put your name in the chat. Uh, white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to our democracy. Um, our former president recently said that he will be a dictator on day one. Uh, and if that doesn't alarm everybody, I don't, I don't know what it would take. I also heard a story on NPR recently where four out of 10 Americans prefer an authoritarian government. So the work that we do here is really, really important. We are a nonprofit organization uh, and we act as your voice to elected officials all across the state at every level. So be sure, like I said, to subscribe to all of our social media. And if you aren't already a member, what are you doing, right? We need members to activate, get involved and participate in their local government because we have these Friday talks where we have incredible speakers, you know, historians, authors, elected officials, you name it. Next Friday, we are going to be speaking with Miles, and I, I know I'm gonna butcher his na name, Chama, for a discussion ab about the death penalty. Does it violate church state separation? So you'll wanna be sure to tune in for that. But for today, I'm really excited. Uh, today we have uh, Miles Taylor. Uh, he's the author of Let the Lord Sort Them, The Rise and Fall of the Death Penalty, which won J. Anthony Lucas and Writers League of Texas Book Awards. His work has been published uh, by the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, and he was on a team that won a 2021 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. He lives in Austin, Texas. Oh my gosh, Texas. But at least you're in Austin, right? <laughs> um, I think that's not my bio, actually. Oh my gosh, wait, what? Oh my goodness, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm so sorry. Hold on just a second. Let me get the correct bio because you're right. That is the one for next week. So boy, am I embarrassed. Okay, so let's get to it correctly. Matthew Taylor, not Miles Taylor, is a senior scholar at the Institute for Islamic Christian and Jewish Studies in Baltimore, where he specializes in Muslim Christian dialogue evangelical and Pentecostal movements, religious politics in the U.S., and American Islam. Prior to coming to ICJS, Taylor received, uh, served on the faculty of Georgetown University and the George Washington and George Washington University. He's the creator of the acclaimed audio documentary series, uh, Charismatic Revival Fury, the New Apostolic Reformation, which details how networks of extremist Christian leaders helped instigate the January 6th insurrection. His forthcoming book, like you said, I think you said September 2024, The Violent Take It By Force, further examines the rising tide of Christian political extremism and how it's threatening American democracy. My apologies. Quite <laughs> all right. Quite I'm all right. So but such an impressive resume. And so without any further delay, let us go ahead and just hand it over to you. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Let me just share my screen here. All right. Uh, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see that, Jeannie? Okay, perfect. Great. So um, thank you for having me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the research that I've been doing, some of the, the content that goes both into my um, audio documentary series that Jeannie mentioned, and then also in the, my forthcoming book, which really centers around the Capitol riot. Um, and I want to talk about what the Capitol riot was about. Um, I would do this as a pop quiz if we were all live and I could see your faces, but instead I'll do it a little bit more rhetorically and, and you can follow along at home there. Um, so uh, seven questions here. Does anyone recognize this flag? This flag with the, the blue canton in the corner and the, the red cross. This is what is popularly called the Christian flag. Um, it's actually an ecumenical Protestant flag that was created at the end of the 19th century. Um, but then more, more recently, it's been more adopted by evangelical Christians as, as a sign of affirmation of evangelical faith. In fact, I w went to evangelical school growing up, and we would pledge allegiance to the American flag every morning, and then we would pledge allegiance to this Christian flag, um, right? So this, is, this has been a, a, a ritualized part 
of evangelical belonging and evangelical identity for quite a long time now. And at the Capitol right, you saw these flags all over the place, right? So people are showing up and, and what message are they trying to bring? Well, they wanna show their Christian flag. Um, the second uh, slide here highlights um, this, this event that happened actually the day before the Capitol riot. Um, it was in Freedom Plaza, which is just a couple blocks from the White House. So this was a precursor event, January, January 6th. It was in, in some ways seen as a ramp up event, kind of gearing the crowds up for um, January 6th. And um, the this, it was interspersed with Christian worship. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, pastors who spoke at this rally. In fact, the first half of it, it was about an eight hour rally and about the first half of it was uh, predominantly pastor speaking, including this man. Che on. And this is what Che on said. I believe this week we are going to throw Jezebel out and Jehu is going to rise up. And we are going to rule and reign through President Trump and under the lordship of Jesus Christ, because I'm telling you the consequences are severe if Biden or Harris becomes president. Lord, we bind the spirit of Jezebel, the principality of Jezebel, off this nation in Jesus' mighty name. And we loose justice, Lord. We loose righteousness. We loose revival a great awakening, and Lord, we're asking for reformation. Now, I'm sure some of that sounds a little bit familiar to some of you, but some of it might also strike you as, oh, that, that's a little bit odd. I'm, I'm not sure what he's talking. What is the spirit of Jezebel? What is a Jehu, right? So there, there's, there's this invocation. These are actually biblical references, but it sometimes can feel a little bit obscure. Or there were a number of groups of people on the day of January 6th who gathered around the Capitol and sang worship music, Christian worship music, including this group. You can see the in the corner of the, the left-hand picture there, you can see the Capitol in the background there. So they're, they're just yards from the Capitol as it's being stormed. And this is what they are singing. There is one body. We have one Lord. United in the spirit, we are going forth with his praises on our lips and a sword in our hands. We are marching on with power as we possess this land. We are the people of the Lord. We're a holy nation, a chosen generation called to show forth his praise. We are the people of the Lord. We're a holy nation, believers in Jesus, lifting up our voices to the Lord. So it raises the question, why are people singing outside of a riot? And why are they singing this? What is, what is the purpose of this, these particular lyrics? What are they driving towards? What is, why gather and do this kind of ritualized religious act next to an ongoing riot. Um, you might have seen these before, um, but there were a number of people with these horns, these ram's horns, blowing them outside of the Capitol. These are called shofars. Um, they um, are um, they're actually they actually originate in Jewish usage as part of uh, Jewish liturgy around the high holidays, especially. Um, but these people are not Jewish. Who are using them. In fact, they are Christians who are using them. Um, and a number of Christians have, have taken to blowing shofars, and you can even see they, they, they sometimes will wrap them in kind of American flag symbolism. And they're even, one of the women that was photographed here even went up to the broken out windows of the Capitol and blew her shofar into the Capitol. She didn't enter the building as far as I know, but she stood outside the broken out windows blowing her shofar into the Capitol. Why? What's the purpose of that? What 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 is what is the goal of that? I noticed in the the chat that that um, some people already noticed the pine tree flag or the appeal to heaven flag, but these flags were everywhere on January sixth. You can see them in these photographs. I have tried um, to count them. There, there's a little bit of a uh, panopticon um, dimension to January sixth. Nobody was taking objective kind of distant photography of the whole thing. Ever all the the images, all the video, all the photography that we get usually comes from the rioters themselves or from press who are embedded within the crowds. And so you, it's hard to get the kind of big scale, but I would estimate there were dozens, maybe even hundreds of these appeal to heaven flags. Now, this is a Revolutionary War flag. It goes back to, it was commissioned by um, George Washington to fly over the Massachusetts State Navy. But here it's taken on a, a religious dimension, it has a religious significance for these folks. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we get along here. 
This man here on the left, he's a pastor. His name is Ren Shuffman. Um, he came from Oklahoma. He drove from Oklahoma to be in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. He felt that God had called him to be there. Um, and he did not go into the Capitol, but he stood outside offering what some Christians would refer to as prayer ministry. So there were people coming out of the, the, the Capitol, and he would pray for them, including this man on the left, on the right here. And this is what he, this, this man on the, the right actually was inside the Capitol, actually witnessed Ashley Babbitt being shot, uh, was like firsthand witness to her being shot. And he comes out, encounters Ren Shuffman. Ren Shuffman is shooting a video, a selfie video of himself doing prayer. And he says, can I pray for you? And this is what he prays. Lord, protect this soldier for you, this man that was brave. Father, Lord, I just declare right now that this lion heart, that the angels of God be protecting over him. Father, Lord, any trauma, any trauma from this event, Lord, I just declare and decree right now that it's all broken. We declare right now the blessing and favor of God on his life. Right? So again, an odd encounter outside of the Capitol riot where you have this pastor praying these blessings over a rioter. But there's, there's, there's invocations in here that are particular to a particular kind of, of Christianity. And lastly, and this is the, the last question I'll, I'll, I'll put up here, is you have these two women, um, Cindy Jacobs and Becca Greenwood, who um, they had a stage set up just off the site of the Capitol, just off the southwest corner of the Capitol building. You can see it in the background there. Um, they had a, a PA system and microphone, and they identify as prophets. And they were helping to lead prayers and exercising demons over the Capitol from this stage on January 6th. So what form of Christianity do Cindy Jacobs and Becca Greenwood represent? So the Christianity that was on display in the Capitol riot and the surrounding crowds was not accidental or incidental, right? Just as we pay attention to the political slogans and the ideas of the rioters, we need to take these Christian assertions and identities seriously. This is a core part of the message that many of the rioters were trying to send, right? As they were getting up that morning or as they were packing their bags to go to Washington, D.C., they're thinking, I need to pack my Christian flag. I need to pack my appeal to heaven flag. I need to, 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 to be ready to prophesy, right? They, they, their, their identities, their Christian identities are, are embedded in the way that they are there. And that is an overt part of what they are trying to signal by how they dress, how they operate, the things they carry that day. So as I'm sure you're familiar with, at a basic level, this is all part of what we would call American Christian nationalism. And, and Christian nationalism is just one form of religious nationalism, right? It's part of the, the spread, the species of, um, of religious nationalism, conflating your own religious identity, your political clan, and your sense of patriotism with your religion, right? Very, very common phenomenon in the modern world, right? Um, globally right now, religious nationalism is on the rise. We see this um, in, in, in places like Myanmar with Buddhist nationalism, and also in Sri Lanka. You have Christian nationalism as a growing force in, in Russia and Hungary and Brazil. You have Hindu nationalism in India, right? So this is not a uniquely American nor a uniquely Christian phenomenon. But in the U.S., um, religious nationalism especially manifests as Christian nationalism. And in the U.S., we, we especially see this in this assertion that the U.S. was founded as and or should be today a Christian nation, right? Now, there's a tendency in conversations about Christian nationalism to talk about this as though it's one single thing. And I would actually argue it's more helpful to think about American Christian nationalism as, as a tendency with several interwoven strands, with different forms of Christianity, different forms of Christian identity contributing to this broader phenomenon of, of Christian nationalism. So just if I was breaking it out, I would say there is what you could call maybe a form of secular Christian nationalism, not using that form, not, not using that word in terms of atheism, but in terms of it being less attached to religion, right? So this is less driven by theology as such and much more interested in culture. And so you have groups like the Proud Boys who talk, well, they'll sometimes talk about themselves as Christian. They'll even raise crosses in some of their protests. But when you actually boil down, they, they aren't really talking theology. They aren't really talking about the intricacies of Christian identity. They'll talk about themselves as Western chauvinists or as male chauvinists sometimes as well, right? So there's, there's a strong masculine identity built in, but it's not really a, a, a lot of, of kind of Christian theology. 
Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum from them, and still as Christian nationalists, would be what we could call a reformed or reconstructionist version of Christian nationalism. The reconstructionists were a group of Calvinist theologians in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so this, this form is very Calvinist and systematically theological. They care about theology. They're very influential among leaders. It's a little bit more intellectual in some ways than what the Proud Boys are doing. Um, but you can see books, a lot of the books that are coming out that are affirmative of Christian nationalism have largely been inspired by this Calvinist tendency. Groups like, like the, or people like Andrew Torba, who is the CEO of this um, far-right um, Gab social media company that are drawing heavily on this kind of reconstructionist theology. And then, as, as Jeannie mentioned, there's, there's a phenomenon that is broadly called white Christian nationalism. I would say that white Christian nationalism is, is very important, but it's only one type of Christian nationalism, at least in the way that I would categorize these things. And so the white Christian nationalism is often, often coming out of the South, sometimes out of the Midwest, places that are, that are more white ethnically, more predominantly white. Um, but this is where you can see real blendings of more neo-Nazi type of ideologies. So here you have that appeal to heaven flag fl flying at an, at an Oregon rally alongside white nationalists who are flying the Sonnenrad, which is one of the Nazi symbol flags, right? So this is, the, and for, for white Christian nationalists, and you can see this in some of the survey data, a lot of their affirmations of Christian identity are as much about race as they are about religion. So this is very important for them to, to again, they're la they're layering in race in addition to kind of clan, the political clan and party and religion. La race becomes another layer that they're adding into this. And then you have forms like the, what we could call Catholic integralist Christian nationalism, which tends to be more astute, more academic. The integralists are very, very much drawing on um, the, the philosophy and theology of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and so this is very, they're very, they tend to be very interested in constitutional questions and constitutional law, very intellectual. This is a cartoon about um, these Catholic integralists kind of depicting them as crusaders within the context of broader academic discussions. So the question I'd like to pose and where I'd like to focus us for the rest of our time is what type of American Christian nationalism was most clearly on display in the Capitol riot? What was the predominant genre? Of Christian nationalism that we find in the Capitol riot. And I would argue that in all of the, 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 the folks that I shared, and even beyond these kind of seven slides that I shared, I would say that, that the predominant form of leaders and expressions and ideas of Christian nationalism in the Capitol riot come from what we could call independent charismatic Christianity, sometimes also called independent network charismatic Christianity. Let me, let me break down what we mean by that. So um, the, the term uh, charismatic uh, it comes from the, the Greek, um, it's a New Testament term um, called charismata, uh, which is a reference to the gifts or the graces of God. Um, and these, so to be charismatic means that you are a Christian who's invested in accessing the supernatural dimensions, the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit that are described in the life of the early church in the New Testament. These are things like speaking in tongues, miracles, words of prophecy, those sorts of things. That, that, those are all dimensions of charismatic Christianity. Now, when, when you have the adjective independent with that, independent is a synonym for non-denominational. So in other words, these are people who are not attached to the bureaucracy or accountability um, or governance of denominational bodies. So these are largely independent ministries, independent churches, often mega churches, but they, they are not attached to these broader denominational things that usually mo most Christians, at least most Protestants in the United States, um, belong to a denomination. But the, the, this, this sector of Christianity is non-denominational and charismatic. You might think of it, so most people have heard of Pentecostalism, but Pentecostalism is, um, is, is a denominational movement that emerges in the early 20th century. So all, mo almost everyone who's, who's a part of a, a Pentecostal church belongs to a Pentecostal denomination. These are kind of the cousins of the Pentecostals, right? The, the independent charismatics are like the non-denominational wing of Pentecostalism. This is, uh, when you put these two things together, the, the charismatic and the independent, this is the fastest growing segment of American Christianity. It is very ethnically diverse and very globally connected. 
Um, this is not only a phenomenon in uh, the United States. This is something that is growing rapidly around the world. In fact, it's um, growing more rapidly than just about any religious movement we've ever observed in, in human history. Um, this is the realm of televangelists, of mega churches, of celebrity preachers, right? I sometimes refer to the independent charismatic sector as the Silicon Valley of the American church. They're very interested in technology. They're very interested in, um, in innovation. They're very um, media savvy. Um, they're very experimental in the way that they think about religion. And again, without the boundaries of denominations holding things in check, they, they can really spiral in a lot of different directions. Um, and so when you put these things together though, it creates a form of Christian nationalism that's very much driven by prophecy and by supernatural expectations. These are not folks who are like kind of tactical and we're going to plan out exactly how we take over society so much as they expect God is going to help them take over society. And to understand this movement, we really have to, and especially the capital right, we really have to think about one of the great theorists of independent charismatic Christianity, a man named C. Peter Wagner. Wagner was a, a seminary professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. Um, I attended Fuller. I didn't overlap with him. I, he, he retired a few years before I got there. But um, Wagner was um, a, a professor at Fuller Seminary from 1971 until about 1999 when he retired. Um, and he was a, an expert in church growth, this kind of idea that you can bring the data of social science, blend it with evangelical theology, and help churches or movements to grow rapidly. And over the course of his career, especially starting in the 1980s, 1990s, Wagner becomes increasingly fixated with these independent charismatic churches and the networks that exist among them. And he sees that as the real future growth of the church. He thinks that that is going to be the cutting edge of, of the church will be through these independent charismatic networks. In 1996, um, he helps coin a term that called the New Apostolic Reformation to describe this mushrooming post-denominational, again, kind of non-denominational friend that is charismatic, that he believes is, is a work of God that will be led by modern day apostles and prophets. And I'll, I'll talk about the apostles and prophets in just a sec. Um, so in 1999, he leaves Fuller um, to work full time and building this new apostolic reformation idea that, that he's, he's really glommed onto. Um, and Wagner died in, in 2016. So he died about um, four years before the Capitol riot. But I would argue that he had a huge impact on what happened on January 6th. And I'll, I'll make that case to you. Um, so the central ideas of Wagner's new apostolic reformation, all of which factor very, very importantly into um, January 6th. So one is this idea of apostolic and prophetic governance of the church. And again, I'll, I'll get into these in much more detail. The second one is called what is the seven mountain mandate which we call the, the political theology of the NAR, kind of their approach to politics and culture. And the, the last is something called strategic level spiritual warfare. Again, some, I'm, I'm, I'm building your vocabulary today. All right, so um, what does it mean that apostles and prophets govern the church? Well, the model that Wagner, and this is in many ways Wagner's most central idea, most central innovation, is that instead of denominations or bureaucratic pastors or bishops or elders governing the church, it should be charismatic individuals who identify as apostles and prophets. And he, he would talk about the, the life of the early Christian church as the first apostolic age. And he believed that in 2001, we started the second apostolic age, an age of renewal in the life of uh, the, the modern church. So Wagner and, and, and the organizations that he created, there's no central organization to the New Apostolic Reformation. There's no, there's no membership cards. There's no way that you can perfectly identify, oh, this person is part of the NAR. Instead, it's these diffuse networks. So Wagner did create some organizations and people were part of those. He had his own inner circle called the Eagles Vision Apostolic Team. That was his uh, group of about 30 mentees. Um, but he created all these kind of institutions with all these different groups of prophets and apostles. These are global networks. They don't have clear national boundaries. Most denominations um, operate within the boundaries of modern nations. These do not. And these apostolic networks often span. Across, they're transnational in many ways. This is an egalitarian movement. Many people think of, um, of Christian nationalism as being patriarchal and dominated by men. In, in Wagner's movement, men or women could be apostles or prophets. Um, and uh, be, again, because of this transnational dimension, there's, it's also pretty multi-ethnic in the way that they um, approach these, these, these roles of apostles and prophets. You'd have today thousands of global apostles 
And the idea is that apostles don't compete with each other. They're not, they're not building contending empires, but they're all working together to bring about a great revival. Now, in, in Wagner's schema and his, in his approach, apostles are the ones who primarily govern the church. They're, they're kind of the network builders, the entrepreneurs, and they, but they're assisted by prophets who hear directly from God and speak the words of God and, and give counsel to the, the apostles. So there, there's, there's, there's slightly differentiated roles, but the, the, these, they're, they're understood to both be kind of the governance of the church. And apostles and prophets work together very closely. Sometimes people identify as both an apostle and a prophet, again, because they, they understand this as a matter of, of gifting from God. People are gifted to be apostles or gifted to be prophets. And so a, apostles are understood to be entrepreneurially building and connecting things and creating these global apostolic networks of ministries, non-denominational non churches, NGOs. And the, these can become quite enormous, quite, quite impressive. So it, it, you remember um, Che On. I mentioned him, he was speaking on January 5th. He's right down there at the, at the bottom in, in the red circle. Che On runs an apostolic network called Harvest International Ministry. He's based in Pasadena, California. And um, Harvest International Ministry, that is Che On's apostolic network, has 25,000 ministries spread over 65 countries. Harvest International Ministry is larger than a lot of the, almost all of the denominations in the United States. But no one's ever heard of it because it's operating in many ways off the books as it's not even recognized as a denomination in most surveys, but it's all led by Cheon. He is, he is the apostle over that network. So part of what happened in the, in the course of the Trump presidency was that these folks became very embedded within um, Trump, the Trump administration. I can, I can give some more of the, the background of this if people are interested in the Q&A, um, but these people really attached themselves to Trump and Trump really embraced these folks. So Lance Wallnau, who is an apostle and a prophet and who was a member of Wagner's inner circle, was one of the first religious leaders to meet with Trump and endorse him. Um, Paula White Kane, who uh, was Trump's spiritual advisor, the head of his evangelical advisory board. She's not uh, technically part of the New Apostolic Reformation Networks, but she has identified as an apostle and she very much exists in this independent charismatic world. And she was really the bridge builder who brought in a lot of these folks from the New Apostolic Reformation and made them key advisors to Donald Trump, people who were often meeting with Trump. Trump visited a lot of their churches when he was campaigning, and it became a, a very important uh, layer to the religious leadership um, that was surrounding Donald Trump were these apostles and prophets, many of them with very deep ties to Wagner's networks. And so the, some of them are formal advisors to Trump. Some of them are informal advisors. Some of them hosted him at, at their churches. But when it comes to the Capitol riot, the you had a number of these folks showing up at the Capitol riot. And part of the reason for this is in the lead up to the 2020 election, you had hundreds of these charismatic prophets who all said that that um, Donald Trump is destined by God, is, is, is willed by God to win the 2020 election. God, that, that God wants Donald Trump to win the 2020 election. And so you have um, this, this, this kind of fervor that builds up. And then when Trump refuses to concede the election, almost all of these prophets refuse to recant their prophecies. And they say, well, God must be planning to intervene in some way in order to put Donald Trump back into office. And you have a striking number of these apostles and prophets who are present on January 6th and in the religious rallies leading up to the Capitol riot, including Cindy Jacobs and Becca Greenwood, who are both um, adopt, spiritual daughters, adopted daughters of, of uh, Peter Wagner's, Che On, who is again, a disciple of Peter Wagner's, even Ren Shuffman, that pastor who was praying outside the Capitol um, for different rioters, a few months after the Capitol riot, he stopped calling himself a, a prophet, or a pastor, and started calling himself an apostle. Right, and you had actually roving bands of these prophets that were a part of the crowds, not so much going in to the Capitol building, but part of the crowds that were surrounding the Capitol and and, and endorsing a lot of this. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I'm sorry. Yep. You know, I know you wanted to take questions at the end, but you said adopted daughters. Yeah. Do you mean like literally they were adopted, or? So so in, in the independent charismatic world, because you don't have formal leadership networks, they, they often default to more familial or apprenticeship um, kind of modes of leadership training. And so the, the, the common language is people will talk about their spiritual father or their spiritual mother. 
um, in reference to people who have mentored them. And so everyone who is in this Eagles Vision Apostolic team referred to Peter Wagner as their apostle, but also as their spiritual father. In the case of Cindy Jacobs and Becca Greenwood, they were really were almost adopted into Wagner's family. They were so close. They were, they were the people who were like in the room as he was dying with his family members. So they really were incredibly close to Wagner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, and, and, you know, the reason I ask is because I know quite a few uh, people who were adopted and oftentimes they were adopted by fundamentalist Christians. So like, mm. I, you know, I'm fascinated by that anyway. So I don't, this was, this I was all voluntary adoption. Okay, this, gotcha. this was not from childhood. This was, this was all adults. Thank you. So when we come to the second seven mountain mandate, this idea of the seven mountain mandate, um, when we talk about uh, Christian theology, um, all Christians have what is called an eschatology. Um, eschatology is just a technical theological term for uh, beliefs about the end of the world. And in the case of the New Apostolic Reformation, they hold what is called a victorious eschatology. So they believe that the church is, is not going to be defeated and then need Jesus to come back and save them. No, the church is going to fight. And, and they use phrases like revival and reformation to refer to this type of fighting. And the, the church will hold sway over much of global society as possible. And then when Jesus comes back, victoriously welcome Jesus. And the main manifestation of this eschatology in the NAR is what is called the Seven Mountain Mandate. And the Seven Mountain Mandate was created by Lance Wallnow, that guy that you saw in the photo with Trump, the one who was one of the first Christian leaders to endorse Donald Trump. Wallnow was a disciple of Wagner, so very, he also was, called him a spiritual father. And the idea of the Seven Mountain Mandate is you can divide up society into these seven spheres, these seven er areas of influence, um, religion, family, education, media, government, business, and the arts. Um, and, and through those seven mountains, the idea is that Christians need to conquer the tops of all of these mountains in every society. So every the United States has the seven mountains, Brazil has the seven mountains, Mexico has the seven mountains, and that Christians are mandated by God in their theology to control positions of influence in each of these seven mountains. And so Christians should seek to take over the, the education mountain. They should seek to take over the government mountain and then govern and influence society from the top down. So if you think of most um, Christian or even uh, political organization, religious right organizations, most of it is premised on an idea of kind of a grassroots mobilization, right? You get more and more Christian voters involved, you get more Christians involved in politics, and, and, and through that, their influence will kind of rise up in a sort of majoritarian way. The idea of the Seven Mountain Mandate is a, 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 a top-down maneuver, a vanguard maneuver. You take over the positions of power and influence in society and then govern from the top down. And so a, a, many of the people who were advocating for the, the Capitol riot were endorsing this Seven Mountain concept that, that what Lance Wallner put forward. And this language of fighting to conquer the Seven Mountains was extremely important and increasingly violent and apocalyptic in the season leading up to the Capitol riot. So Che On, who um, again was, was there on January 6th, um, on November 23rd, so after the election was called for Joe Biden, before January 6th, posted, there's no separation of church and state. God's kingdom involves all seven mountains of influence. And this is very much true for these NER folks. They don't believe in the separation of church and state, again, because of this seven mountains theology. Lance Wallnow was there on January 6th. He was supposed to speak at um, this rally. There were actually three rallies that were planned for January 6th. One was the one on January 5th that Cheon spoke at, which was uh, in Freedom Plaza. It was sometimes called the Rally to Revival. The, then there's the, the one on, on the morning of January 6th that Donald Trump spoke at at the Ellipse. And then you have, there, there's a third planned rally that day at the Capitol. Uh, it was planned for 1 p.m. that day. It was supposed to be um, to, to continue putting pressure on these lawmakers. That third rally got canceled because the rioting broke out. Um, but the people who were supposed to speak there were people like Doug Mastriano and Lauren Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, Ali Alexander, and Lance Wallnow. He was one of the scheduled speakers for this, this rally. Last section here is on strategic level spiritual warfare. Um, Wagner's New Apostolic Reformation believes and it takes this concept. And this concept of, of spiritual warfare is very common among Christians. Um, and really is, is, is this idea that there's a co there's combat between angels and demons going on invisibly all around us. And the Christians are, are impacted, the world's impacted by that, this demonic angelic activity. And the Christians through prayer and other means can kind of participate in that. Um, but in these folks, 
theology, they talk about strategic or strategic level spiritual warfare. And the idea is that there are hierarchies of demons. There are hierarchies of, of, of these kind of demonic hordes. And so they're commander level and general level demons. And then the idea is that apostles and prophets are generals of spiritual warfare. And they can create campaigns of spiritual warfare, organized campaigns of spiritual warfare to displace what they call territorial spirits, these, these commander level demons. And so one of the most popular campaigns of strategic spiritual warfare was created by another mentee, another disciple of, of Wagner's, a man named Dutch Sheets. And this is called the Appeal to Heaven campaign. Um, Dutch Sheets in 2013 was given one of these pine tree flags, these Appeal to Heaven flags, and he believed that he had this prophetic moment where God spoke to him and said, this is the sign by which America will be restored. And so he starts spreading this, I call it a prophetic meme, this meme of the appeal to heaven flag. And, and they start using it all over the place. In fact, um, um, a, a couple of weeks before the 2020 election, Donald Trump was at an apostle in an NAR church in Las Vegas. And the, the, the pastor who was an apostle in the NAR got up and held up an appeal to heaven flag and said, this is, this, I, this is the sign of your victory. And this, 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 post went all over um, social media. Dutch Sheets, this guy who coined the, this, was, was one of the most effective instigators for getting Christians to show up on January 6th. He has a daily podcast, has an incredible influence. He was, in fact, at the White House on December 29th, 2020, for a two-hour meeting. He brought 15 NAR apostles and prophets, and they were prophesying and decreeing and declaring inside the White House, meeting with high-level officials. They've never revealed who they actually met with. Um, and uh, I part of partly through some reporting that my myself and my friend Brad Onishi did, we revealed that that Speaker of the House Mike Johnson has deep ties to Dutch Sheets and some of Dutch Sheets' disciples, and in fact flies an appeal to heaven flag outside of his office um, even today. Right, so the symbol of Christian nationalist spiritual warfare is flying outside of the Speaker of the House's office today. Now, some of the participants in the Capitol riot and many of the people in the surrounding crowds understood their presence there as a form of spiritual warfare. And that's why how, that helps us to understand a lot of the manifestations of Christianity we see in the crowds. Show, so, so, right, the, these appeal to heaven flags, you can even see these on the front lines of the Capitol riot where the, the crowds begin to clash with the Capitol police officers. People are using these appeal to heaven flags on poles to beat Capitol police officers. Shofars are understood by, in the independent charismatic world, to be a weapon of spiritual warfare, right? What is this group singing? They are singing about his praises in our in, on our lips and a sword in our hands. They are doing spiritual warfare through worship, which is a very common practice within these independent charismatic circles. And then, of course, you have Cheon. What is he praying about? Lord, we bind the spirit of Jezebel, the principality of Jezebel, off this nation in Jesus' mighty name. And, and similarly, Cindy Jacobs and Becca Greenwood are trying to do an exorcism of the Capitol as the riot is going on, because they believe that territorial spirits have taken over the U.S. Capitol. So if you want to understand what drove January 6th, I believe you have to understand this independent charismatic style of Christian nationalism. All right, as I wrap up, let me just offer a few thoughts on implications for Arizona, because I know um, that, that, that that's a little more your you all's focus. Um, I'll make a point. This may be controversial. I'm happy to talk about it more in um, in the, the, the Q&A. Some Christian nationalism is extremist and actually threatening our democracy. And I think other kinds of Christian nationalism are somewhat benign or more sentimental. And I think those present different kinds of threats to pluralism and to separation of church and state in the United States. And I would just say, as, as folks who identify as activists who want to counter this stuff, please choose carefully what you are targeting in 2024. Because there will be a lot of Christian nationalist mobilization that you'll see over the next year. I am very, very concerned about what happens, not only in the 2024 election itself, but also in the aftermath of it, just as we saw in 2020. And choose your battles. Pick the, the folks who are real threats. I'm not saying those other things are not real, but choose your battles because there are, there are very dangerous forms of Christian nationalism as we saw on January 6th. These NAR networks have local leaders and just in every state. And knowing who those local leaders are can be very, very helpful in terms of understanding how they are operating in their in their um, kind of plans and in their, their um, local organizing. 
Um, in Arizona, I, I pictured here three of the folks who are most prominent in the NAR networks. So you have Hal and Cheryl Sachs, a couple. They, they are um, very close associates of Dutch Sheets and Cindy Jacobs. In fact, they were there on January 6th um, and were with Cindy Jacobs at the Capitol. They are very connected, politically connected in Arizona. Um, and then Lynn Munsell here is the president of Arizona Christian University. He's also a very close associate. In fact, um, in the picture there at the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see, but seated is Carrie Lake. Um, this this picture, this video was posted on Twitter uh, a few days before the, the uh, 2022 midterms, before Carrie Lake was, was not elected. But this is, these are charismatic Christian pastors anointing Carrie Lake with oil and praying over her and blessing her. It, the picture was kind of famous because of Mark Driscoll, who's the famous, infamous pastor of Mars Hill, who um, is kind of a notorious authoritarian, was in the picture. But also in the picture is Hal Sachs who was present and also participating in that, right? So you have to kind of watch how these people operate, how they calibrate their things. Um, these charismatic networks also interface closely with the rest of the Christian nationalist infrastructure, particularly pertinent in Arizona's case is Turning Point USA, which is headquartered in Phoenix, which is really one of the most uh, virulent um, organizations in terms of pushing these Christian nationalist narratives. And then last point, and then we'll, we'll take some questions, is some politicians are basically immune to pressure from revealing their close ties to Christian nationalism. When we wrote the article about Mike Johnson, he blew us off and said, so what? I fly the flag, who cares? And he's safe in his district, he's safe in his caucus. But in a swing state like Arizona, politicians are more sensitive to this stuff. They are more sensitive to having these things, these connections that they have revealed. And so the more that you can document and publicize about these connections and draw real lines between what happened on January 6th, the really scary manifestations that we see of this stuff and these politicians, the more you can push them and, and, and help to kind of curb some of this stuff, at least in the public sphere. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. I recognize I just I gave you a drink from the fire hose. I'm happy to take, take questions. You know what? This group, we love to drink from the fire hose. So thank you for that. <laughs> and and we have so many really well-educated people in this group. And I love how you really catered this discussion at the end for folks in Arizona, because all eyes are on Arizona. And, you know, the the road to the to the White House and to so many other things drives directly through Arizona. So I very much appreciate you making that connection. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start at the top of the chat. Uh, this one comes from Mark. Mark says, we all know that the mainly mainline Republicans are afraid to confront, confront Trump for the most part, because they both fear Trump and the demise of the Republican party. Do you see a parallel with mainline Protestants and Catholic religious leaders who don't want to criticize evangelicals? because they fear the decline of Christianity? Great question. It's a good question. I don't see that, actually. Um, I, I think you already have a pretty stark divide between mainline Protestants and evangelicals. Um, it's an aesthetic divide. It's a cultural divide. It's a class divide. Uh, it's a theological divide. And um, main, in my experience, I, I, and as somebody who is a mainline Protestant today, um, no, mainline Protestants are pretty comfortable critiquing evangelicals, critiquing Christian nationalism. The large problem is that mainline Protestants are not mobilized to, to fight against this stuff um, and are, are largely ignorant of it, in fact, kind of, kind of don't, don't aren't paying close attention. Catholicism is more complicated, right? Because it's, it's, it's a big tent. You've got conservative Catholics who are very much closely aligned and would I even follow a lot of these Christian nationalist tendencies. And you have liberal Catholics who, like mainline Protestants, tend to be more detached from these conversations. Um, but no, it, it's not, it's not a lack of, or it's not, it's not an attachment to Christianity and a desire to protect Christianity. It's apathy and, um, and ignorance that really drives a lot of liberal Christian, um, ambivalence about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. The next question, hold on, wait, wait, um, this is another great question from Mark. Um, it's He said, it sounds like getting high on Jesus. Is this because a lot of their followers came from 12-step movements to overcome drug and alcohol abuse? That's such a, we don't even consider how so many people are probably, you know, that's maybe, maybe even their first exposure to like, you know, that kind of evangelical, like there's only, you know, you got to pray to a God, a higher power. Do you see a connection? Um, there is a connection. Um, so 
part of what charismatic spirituality offers people are these very immersive experiences. Um, and um, that sometimes they, they would talk about these exper as experiences of deliverance. And they'll often talk about kind of being freed from addiction, um, freed from mental health issues through these experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And but then th th those experiences become their own epistemology, by which I mean their, their own mode of verification for knowledge. And so then when you pair right this this charismatic worship experience where like oh the prophets are speaking and i'm hearing directly from god and then somebody gets up and gives a political message then th those experiences tend to verify whatever is being spoken of um and so i think this is a lot of how we can understand some of the conspiracy theories that have have really taken hold in these conservative christian circles is a lot of it is not they they are not approaching these things through a sort of rational or or intellectual lens they're, they're having these profound experiences, and those experiences then shore up their sense of political identity, their sense of um, Trump support. So yes, there are connections into um, some of these 12-step uh, programs, those sorts of things, but it's more that, that this is offering an alternative mm -hmm. to other forms of kind of approach to addiction, is, oh, you can just have this one experience and be delivered of it, but then the politics tend to come in through the back door as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting because where I live, there's a vehicle that's parked uh, frequently that has a bunch of like QAnon kind of stuff and, mm -hmm. and you know, F Joe Biden and all that kind of stuff, but also the little, you know, the little symbol for AA. So that's yeah. it's a great question. Um, this one comes from Beth. What makes the Christian apostle apostles and prophets think that Trump can be influenced to do anything other than what he wants to do? <laughs> um, history. They, <laughs> Trump did what they wanted him to do. I mean, part so right. I, I think there's there's this tendency to think like uh, dismiss these people as as though they're rubes or silly um, or foolish, and they're just being used by Trump. But the, Trump was using them, and they were using Trump. Right, like they, they, their their agenda was the Supreme Court. It was support for the state of Israel. It was rolling back LGBTQ rights. It was anti-abortion. Trump did what they wanted him to do, right? That he 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 fulfilled his end of the bargain from their perspective. And so, in some sense, if there's a cynicism there, it's not so much on their side because they they saw him as a vehicle for accomplishing their agenda. And they would even talk about this this way. They would use these seven mountains frame. And when Peter Wagner, um, a few months before he died, actually endorsed Donald Trump. Um, and um, the way that he did it was he said, Donald Trump has conquered the business mountain and the media mountain. So why don't we entrust the government mountain to him? Right? So there's, there, the, the, again, it's not, they don't they don't think that Donald Trump is a good Christian. But they think that he's anointed by God to accomplish their agenda, and so they're, they 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 align themselves with him out of out of this sense of prophetic destiny that God has anointed him for this purpose. And the the, the one of the things that Lance Wallner also really pioneered was this idea of Donald Trump is is a type of Cyrus, right? If you if you know your Hebrew Bible, Cyrus was the emperor of the Persians, who when the Jewish people were in exile in the sixth and fifth centuries BCE, um, they, they get sent back, right? So they're, they're in exile in Babylon, the Persian empire and, Cy and Cyrus conquers the Babylonians and then sends the Jewish people back to rebuild Jerusalem. And so Lance Wall now is one, the, the one who's really championing this idea of Donald Trump is a type of Osiris. We conservative Christians are in cultural exile and Donald Trump is not a good man. He's not a good Christian. And he even told Trump, he's like, I know you're not an evangelical. I know you're, I know you're not a Christian, but God has an anointing on your life to do the, to accomplish these purposes. And so I support you. That's kind of the bargain that these folks are making is more that they see that God can anoint even a, a, a an impious person like Trump to accomplish God's purposes. And they believe they know God's purposes. Yeah, wild. Um, so uh, you you mentioned, and I have to bring this up because you mentioned Lee. Uh, what's his name? Lee Munsell. Munsell. Lynn Munson. Yeah, Lynn. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so here in Arizona, and you're probably familiar with this, but uh, earlier in the year, Washington Elementary School District had a 
a contract, right? It, it had been in place for over a decade, I believe, with Arizona Christian University. They got a new board member in 2022, um, you know, a neurodivergent queer woman who is a huge advocate for our most vulnerable communities. And she looked at this contract with uh, a, a Arizona Christian University and was like, wow, have you read their statement of faith? Like you have to say that you uh, think that anybody in the LGBTQ community is an abomination in the eyes of God, that uh, marriage is only between a man and a woman, that birth, uh, that uh, life begins at conception, all the things, right? And and also all these Christian universities and private uh, K-12 schools also in their statement of faith oftentimes have a, 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 an item that says also that like capitalism is the best system of government, which I find fascinating. But my point is they stood up to, and, and just basically said, we're not gonna renew this contract because of this discriminatory behavior. You know, like we don't, we, we can get teachers from other places. And in fact, the, the recruitment of teachers from this university was so small, right? And then who came and stepped in, but Alliance Defending Freedom. Yep. And that one board member stood up to Christo fascism and the rest, all four of them folded. And I get it. I am a former school board member. I know that lawyers for school districts have to advise the district to, right, like be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and not get into something. But like, I I, I just want to hear more about like that connection and, and, you know, what is going on with these folks who are infiltrating and taking over our public education system. Um, so part of the shift that occurs, so the, the, the way that NAR and these other kind of right-wing charismatic networks calibrate is um, when they when Republicans are in power, they, they do everything they can to push their agenda through Republican lawmakers. When Republicans are not in power, they understand that as a period of judgment from God, and they shift their focus to work more locally. And so Lance Wall now helped to create, along with David Barton, who is a very important histor <laughs> historian in the Christian nationalist world, not, not a trained historian, not a good historian, claims to be a historian. Um, they created something called the Truth and Liberty Coalition. And it's headquartered in Colorado Springs. They founded it in 2017. And Truth and Liberty, if you go on their website, you can see all the, the kind of right-wing politicians who are associated with them. It is explicitly about the Seven Mountains, and it is in their statement of purpose that they are about conquering the Seven Mountains. And they are training people on how to take over school boards, how to take over city councils, right? Because again, in their theology, with the Seven Mountains concept, it there that is the mandate. That is what God has told them to do is they are supposed to conquer these things. They are supposed to disciple nations is the way that they would phrase it. They, they need to train and teach our nation good Christian morality. And so there's been a lot of mobilization. And Truth and Liberty is only one of these organizations. TPUSA is training people in this stuff. There's a, been a lot of shift in mobilization towards this kind of local level takeover of the, these organizations, um, often in defiance of the will of the, the parents or people in those school boards. This is the challenge of resisting this stuff democratically. Mm -hmm. Well, and we made a decision as an organization to really focus on those uh, local bodies of government because, you know, th those local bodies, our state or our uh, school boards, our city councils are really the heart of our democracy. And that is where the takeover is happening. And especially in rural communities, right? Yes. Like, so... Uh, we're actually our focus this this year for our secular summit is going to be about how these takeovers happen and how they affect rural communities specifically and how evangelical extremist policies affect those communities disproportionately to like urban communities. Um, uh, all that to say, everybody should like and su subscribe to all of our things, you know, get into our sub stack. I just watched uh, I, I'm still in the process of watching the Paradise Valley Unified School District board meeting that happened last night Four schools in a very, very affluent area of Phoenix are closing. And they are closing because of the expansion of vouchers 
And because of the, you know, wild west mentality that we have here in Arizona about charter approvals and, and who gets to open a charter, there doesn't have to be a needs assessment, right? So whole communities, and, and I will mention that three out of four of those schools are Title I schools. So when I think about Title I schools, those are people who are living in high poverty areas. That means they're probably dealing with food insecurity, with housing insecurity, with transportation insecurity. Like these are the real time of, and this is an urban area, right? Like it's a, it's a metropolitan area. I don't know, a soapbox moment over. Um, there's a question here from Andrew. Uh, he says, and I was fascinated by this too. You divide Christian nationalism into different segments. Do they divide themselves distinctly or overlap in different segments? I mean, the, the term Christian nationalism is often taken as pejorative by these folks. You have a few people who've embraced it. You've had Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, but most people resist being called Christian nationalists. And so I, I, I wouldn't call Christian nationalism a movement in that sense, right? It's, it's not all these people kind of thinking I'm part of Christian nationalism. It's more this tendency, and you see this in the surveys about it, this tendency towards thinking about the U.S. as a Christian nation then manifests in these different ways. So, no, these people do understand themselves theologically very different from, say, the Catholic integralists or these charismatic. Like the, and the, the, most of the Reformed Reconstructionist folks are not charismatic and would even see, would even be dismissive and, and, and um, would look down on these charismatics. Oh, those crazy kind of charismania people, right? And so th there really are these tensions and fissures between what people talk about as Christian nationalism. Well, with if you look into it, there are these spaces where there are wedges between these folks. And God help us if they ever succeed, right? Because then you're just going to have a civil war amongst all these different forms of Christian nationalism about whose form of Christianity is really hegemonic and dominant. Oh, you're muted there. Thanks for that. Jesus. Yep. Yeah. Um, this one comes from Ron. Uh, do you think NAR prophets really believe what they say? I, I think this all the time, Ron. Or are they like others in the past, you know, caught up in this movement, knowing that they are manipulating and, and they just can't get out of it? I mean, I think of people like Mitt Romney here, right? Like who is going to go ahead and vote to confirm everybody in Donald Trump's cabinet or, you know, Senate, you know, the, the Supreme Court. But now he's like, you know, so go ahead. Sorry, answer. <laughs> I know this isn't the answer that many of you want to hear, probably having interacted with a lot of folks online. Yeah, they really believe it. They, they absolutely believe it. I, I okay. can't explain. I've, I've interviewed about two dozen of them. Um, I, I am in uh, through archival research. I am in their correspondence with each other. I, I have notes from their internal meetings. They, 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 who they are in public is who they are in private. They believe mm -hmm. this stuff. You can't explain what they're doing on January 6th apart from them actually believing this stuff. And that's where I, I, I think that this idea of, oh, they couldn't possibly believe this. It sounds so crazy. And, and, and so they must just be cynical and we just need to find the right lever to force their cynicism into a different channel is an extremely misguided notion because they really do believe this stuff that and they 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 act upon it and in many ways the threat to american democracy to american pluralism is not from cynicism it's from true believers who are so bought into this stuff that they will potentially die for it yeah, you know, like, so, like I said, we've expanded to support school boards, public schools in Arizona, we are the wild, wild west when it comes to voucher expansions. And I actually run into some of these Turning Point USA operatives on a regular basis. Tiffany Benson, you may have heard of her, I don't know, like, but she uh, is, she's their darling, because she's a black woman who, you know, speaks to Christian nationalist ideology, and she shows up to these board meetings, even though she doesn't live in the communities. And there was one time where I was like, hey, Tiffany, how's it going? Right? Because we know each other. And the way she looked at me, like the way that she, it was almost like she was seriously trying to shield herself. And I was like, oh, that's right. She thinks I'm a demon. Like she literally thinks I'm possessed by the devil. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's never going to be banter there. Um, there's one great question that I think can close us out because I want to honor your time. It's one o'clock. Sure. Mars asks, what do we do to focus our efforts in Arizona? As I was saying, I, I think um, the, a lot of the stuff that I've encountered in Arizona is not 
has not been publicly talked about or written about, um, including like Len Munsell's connections to the NAR. I have tried to sell some reporters on that story and they haven't bought, right? But if, if, if you understand these networks and understand how they operate, how they're connected, then when you see these folks in pictures with the governor, in pictures with mayors, in pictures with legislators, potentially, again, not some people, some, some folks are in such Christian Republican districts. It, there, there's no leverage. <laughs> sure, I hang out with Dutch Sheets. So what, right? But I think for, for folks who are in these more purple districts or in, in statewide offices, they, they don't want to be seen. With Christian extremists. And I think, I think, and, and let, maybe this is my last word of exhortation. I I think it helps very much to not let the rhetoric get overblown. Right? There are there are Christian nationalists who they like to sing God bless America and have a, an American flag in their church. Not my cup of tea, not a grave threat to American democracy. Doesn't require kind of hair on fire rhetoric about Christo-fascism and kind of totalitarianism and right, like let them have their flag, whatever. There are real threats. There are real Christian extremists. And I think we need to use measured vocabulary and evidence to point out where that extremism manifests itself, hold that up and say, are you really on board with this? Because many Christians who tacitly support this stuff, if they really understood what it was about, would balk at it. But, they, but it all becomes this undifferentiated mass. And then they think, well, those are just our people. Mm -hmm. So I think help, helping people to understand, helping even Christians to understand the real lever, the real types of extremism that we see in, the, in this movement and these folks, I think can really help to drive that wedge between the kind of soft Christian nationalists and the hardline Christian nationalists. And I think that's the divide we have to do. Because if, if, if you look at American democracy, if you look at the surveys, somewhere 45 to 50% of people are sympathetic to Christian nationalism. And if, and if your idea is, okay, we're just gonna make Christian nationalism something that's beyond the pale, something that, that no one can possibly endorse in public, all that creates is reifying the cultural divides, the culture wars, and drives more people into their camp. But if you can drive a wedge and say, hey, look, I understand you think that America was founded as a Christian nation. Are you on board with pluralism today? Do you care about your Jewish and Muslim and Buddhist and Hindu and atheist neighbors? Do you want them to have equality? Then you're on our side. You're part of our coalition mm -hmm. against these folks, right? If we can find ways to drive that wedge, then I think you can potentially build a supermajority to overturn this stuff. But right. it requires maybe holding hands with some people that you might not always like. Right. And, and so like, we always try to, you know, Friday afternoon, here we are, like we're heading into a weekend and it's like doom and gloom. So I think there, there is hope there. There's a lot of hope there because we're all getting ready to probably visit family for the holidays. And it's a great opportunity to differentiate between Christian nationalism and Christianity, right? Like, you know, okay, I get it. You're a Christian. That's a religion. Christian nationalism that's a political ideology. It's a fringe political ideology. Um, I'd also like to say that we do have some media contacts here in Arizona. And just like every other state in the nation, local media is dying. And so we have Arizona Agenda uh, that you should connect with there on Substack. I would also connect with Lookout Phoenix, another publication that's specifically focused on LGBTQ issues and very interested in those kinds of things. So. You have our contact information. And if you would like to get those media contacts, we might be able to help you out. But other than that, Dr. Taylor, I was so look, I'm so I'm just so happy that you joined us today. I can't wait. I can't wait to buy your book. I want to be on the pre-order list. <laughs> I'll I'll send you an email when it comes out. Love that. Oh my gosh. So I hope that everybody has a wonderful weekend. And again, can't thank you enough. This this is going to go down probably as one of my favorite conversations. You really broke it down for us today. And I appreciate so much the work that you do. Thank you all. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you next time.